parks from a very early time defined the city. This was the largest urban outdoor sculpture garden in the country. The parade site lies at a boundary really between what had been a smaller town of Minneapolis and its future. It seemed to me that land was destined for higher things. Over eight million visitors have visited since 1988. It's an object, an object with a strong and wonderful history. The movement of art outside into the sculpture garden was really both an effort on the part of Barnes to show how you could take architectural gallery space and move it into the landscape. It's a place you can have extremely sophisticated high art uh, moments and then you can just roll in the grass and you can stumble upon something that you never would have seen before. You can be in a huge gathering of thousands of people or you can feel as if you're in a room. It can be in the middle of um, a really um, desolate winter day and you can go into the Coles Conservatory and feel like you're um, you know, in a tropical climate. It's a place you can be lots of different things. The Minneapolis Sculpture Garden is a Minnesota Partnership co-production of the Walker Art Center on the web at walkerart.org and Twin Cities Public Television. Funding has been provided in part by the Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund, administered by the Minnesota Historical Society. The Sculpture Garden is one of the crown jewels of the, the park system in Minneapolis. You know, it's the only place where we have a lot of art integrated into a park. It is a contemporary urban sculpture park, but it's built on uh, kind of classical ideas about uh, garden design and certainly a kind of reference to Renaissance Italianate design. Parks were a way to escape from the city. Um, they were a natural escape. At the time, the thinking of Frederick Law Olmsted and Horace Cleveland, who helped design the Minneapolis park system, uh, they believed that you had to have a place to get away from the city, a place that was secluded, quiet, beautiful, um, but natural as well. They didn't believe in much ornamentation, um, which is one reason Minneapolis never had a lot of sculptures. The sculpture garden and parade park space is representative of uh, the transformation of landscape. You have a park at the parade now, the sculpture garden, which has been altered from its natural condition, but has a very active public use. The Dakota people lived in this area for at least 200 years, and this was a sacred area to them as they approached the falls at St. Anthony, and also seasonally spent time at the city lakes, now what we now know as Lake Calhoun. When in the early 1900s, Thomas Lowry saw this opportunity to turn this into a public park, he requested that they not name it the Lowry Parade, but simply the Parade. Where the Parade and the Sculpture Garden are now was once almost all marsh. The park board, to create Hennepin Avenue as a parkway, decided that they had to cut down part of what is Lowry Hill now, which helped fill up the marsh. When the uh, National Guard was looking for a site for a new armory building, Lowry agreed to donate that property as the armory site. It was not a good place to build an armory, um, especially when you look at the pictures of it, it's, it looks like this old fortress. <laughs> um, and it, it began settling very soon after it was built because it was primarily on swamp. Theodore Worth became the park superintendent in 1906, and one of his first ideas for the park that was published was he said he wanted to include a football field on the land as well. The parade playing fields were extremely popular. They were the center of amateur sports, um, outdoor sports in the city. The newspapers talked of crowds of five or 6,000 people watching a single football game at the parade. There were boxing matches held there in the 20s. There were some huge uh, Fourth of July celebrations held on the property. There's kite flying contests. It, it was the major open space in the city um, as the city built up around it.
One of the uses made of the armory building was as a national location for horticulturalists from around the country. And in advance of that, Theodore Worth invited the donation, the sending of bulbs and seeds to be planted in the grounds between the armory and Loring Park. The garden ended up being a huge success, and one of the most successful things about it was is they labeled the plants. So these rare and, and unusual plants that have been planted there that people were testing to see if they grow in, in the local soils um, were labeled, which was a huge hit with the public. So when the, after the convention was done, the, um, the park board all agreed that it should remain as a garden. And it then became known as the Armory Garden. I think the, the creation of a garden there at that time probably made it more likely that that sculpture garden could exist now. After the armory was knocked down in 1934, it just became an empty patch of grass. But the park board did continue um, planting a garden on the old armory garden site, and then it became known often as the Kenwood Garden. The freeway development really started, uh, the construction began in 1967. The Minnesota Highway Department took over part of what is now the Sculpture Garden as part of a construction easement. So they, they were beginning to put e equipment and supplies and, um, and dirt on that land, and that was the end of Kenwood Gardens. When that freeway of construction was eventually done, the Walker began a construction project of their own and rebuilt, you know, built a new Walker Art Center. Walker started talking with the uh, Minneapolis Park Board about creating some kind of cultural complex and incorporating the land of the garden and where the old armory was um, into that concept. The idea though of using parkland as, um, as a part of a cultural complex was also new. You had a confluence of, of a special group of people including David Fisher and Martin Freeman and they were able to agree on management of this park. It just takes the right people at the right time and a good idea and you can have amazing things happen. Well obviously sculpture outdoors um, will change. So Martin Friedman uh, is really one of the great museum directors um, of our time and he was director of the Walker for 30 years. Uh, whether it's in sunlight or uh, seen against the background of snow or yeah, glistening in the rain. He was the key force in partnering with um, the community and the, and the public sector to create the Minneapolis Sculpture Garden. He had that original vision, that potential of what that green space could be and the importance of art as being a kind of magnet in a way that the city didn't have. We had the uh, opportunity to uh, install a few sculptures there over the years before anyone ever thought of a sculpture garden. However, I always worried about the future of that land. In 1981, uh, the park board had a new park superintendent, David Fisher, who tells of receiving a call from someone he had never met, um, which ended up, it was Martin Friedman, calling him because he wanted to have lunch and talk about how they could use that land uh, jointly or if there's something they could do to collaborate there. And David was special in that he was very good at getting and bringing together different people from different places to create a project. That was risky. Why? Oh, it's risky. I think one is, is that something we'd never done before, had ever been done before, is a, is a private institution and a public agency literally going together to build something uh, as risque as a modern art sculpture garden. And it was just something I think we both said, this is what we ought to do.
Martin's vision was to create a space that could reflect the multidisciplinarity of the walker, so not just a space for looking um, at sculpture, but being a platform for ongoing programming, theatrical events, dance, concerts, um, projection, film projections. All those things were imagined. These are the things that make the Walker such a distinct kind of institution of having all these disciplines under one roof. So the sculpture garden became a way to really project that uh, and embrace the community uh, and allow, you know, create a really supple platform for experiencing art in all its dimensions. I think this is so different than any other kind of park that we have. It's not a playground, but it certainly is another aspect of a, of a kid's life that they'd like to go see. Well, first of all, have you ever seen a spoon 52 feet long? <laughs> no, maybe. Klaus Oldenburg is a pop artist. He's taken a lot of ordinary forms, things that you wouldn't think about, like typewriter erasers and clothespins, baseball gloves, and he's turned them into amazing sculptures. I felt that he could do a, a fountain uh, that would be a focal point for the garden. And he and his wife, Kosha Van Bruggen, have been doing a lot of monumental sculpture all over the United States. We said, we'd like you to make a work that will be lively, that people will want to use, and that will be friendly to other works around it. And one day he came into the office of Edward Barnes with a model, and it was wrapped with Kleenex. I had no idea what was going to be in there, no idea. And very slowly, lifted the Kleenex, and there it was, the model for the spoon bridge. Sculptures change its size all the time. And uh, the, uh, d depending on where you stand in relation to this piece, it can be as big as an earring, or it can be as large as an ocean liner. shape of the pond is the outline of a linden tree seed. And these are linden trees. So there are all these sort of connections that are uh, sort of playful and at the same time physical connections to the rest of the garden. What's great about the Spoon Bridge and Cherry is our icon is a piece of art. It's a great piece of art. It's a monumental piece of art, but it doesn't take itself too seriously and it just is out there with its stuff. You know, for all of us uh, Minnesotans who sometimes have trouble getting out of our shell, that's kind of our inner Minnesotan. That's who we really are, I think. And so it struts its stuff right in the middle of, of town. And um, I think it also is this, some sort of strange nod to uh, a culture that can support both the Walker and the State Fair. <laughs> that's kind of a little of both. I think the fact that Oldenburg's um, Kosha Van Bruggen's Spoon Bridge and Cherry, you know, would be in many ways the representative icon to the city. That says something that's incredible about the state of Minnesota and something that's absolutely true, that culture and its commitment to culture is such a defining part of this community and has been for a very long time. Everybody who visits the garden has a reaction to it. They can relate to it, uh, whether it's the super large spoon and the cherry that's fitting in it or for whatever other reason but the other thing I like about that is you see the setting of the pond, the, the water, almost a wetland around it and if you go back and look at the original survey from 1853 you'll see that there was a wetland that literally went through where the spoon bridge and cherry fit. Well, the original Walker Art Center was designed by uh, Edward Larrabee Barnes. He went on to design the sculpture garden, uh, the first seven and a half acres of which were completed in uh, 1988. This is not a freeform uh, park-like space. These are, I hope, well-proportioned outdoor boxes, outdoor galleries where you can have groups of sculpture, each have its own room and feel comfortable. I think what's fascinating about the sculpture garden is it was done, it was completed in 1988. Quite a bit later, 
than the original museum. And Barnes' work had shifted. He had actually went through a postmodern phase at the end of his career. And so the building, the Walker Arts Center, is quite dynamic. It's this stepped galleries that are stepping up around a central core. Uh, and there's a lot of movement um, in it, a dynamic quality. The uh, sculpture garden is very symmetrical with uh, room-like spaces uh, defined by plant material with a cross axis of a main hall and a cross hall. And he was clearly looking at that point in his career at Italian gardens, Renaissance gardens. So you see these two parts of Barnes's career, his late modernist building and his postmodern sculpture garden. The original sculpture garden only went like part way north of where it is, but it was so successful. And the walker was able to raise money to expand the garden all the way up to where Dunwoody Institute is. And then when Martin retired in the early 90s, Kathy Halbreich, who was the director um, who succeeded Martin and was here for 17 years, um, oversaw the expansion of the garden to include another three and a half acres to the 11 acre footprint that we have today. So you have the original Edward Barnes designed four rooms with the cross axis. Then you have the spoon and cherry around the pond as a kind of a break. And then behind that is this landscape by Michael Van Valkenburg. Even though it was just a few years later, it was completed in 1992, there was also a shift toward an, a rediscovery of modern uh, landscape design. And so you see this big sweeping arc, this kind of asymmetrical placement of paths, and a much greater openness and fluidity in the space. Where works of art could be perhaps more nestled in those spaces and be discovered in those spaces than defined you know, by borders or rooms or more um, traditional elements. Minneapolis artist Sia Armajani designed the bridge. When completed, it will be 375 feet long. The Irene Hicks and Whitney Bridge will link Loring Park with the Minneapolis Sculpture Garden. Which is put into place. The enjoyment for those who will use the bridge is only a month away. The third section of the new span was brought into the Twin Cities last night. Workers had hoped to install it overnight when traffic in the area was light. There had been pressure from, or there had been suggestions from the time the freeway uh, was built that separated Loring um, Loring Park from the parade, there had been talk of building a pedestrian bicycle bridge that would reconnect the two over the, you know, the chasm, the, the, some call it the gash, the wound of the freeway. They bought into our idea and, and we made a, a deal that the bridge would be treated as a work of art and maintained as such. The very notion that an artist could design a bridge was itself a bit controversial. Uh, and over a freeway. I mean, that had always been the purview of highway engineers and civil engineers. Um, and I think that uh, his, his pedestrian bridge is uh, a somewhat humorous uh, take on the history of bridges. So there's, there's two sorts of structural ideas in it. There's an arch uh, as one half of it, and then there is this image of a suspension bridge. Of course, it's not really a suspension bridge, but it's uh, the, a reference back to the two major ways in which we've held bridges up in the 20th century, at least. So we used to put little ads in the paper that says to the people, come and watch your garden grow. And people would come down when the cranes were there and the bulldozers were running around watching what was going on. What developed as a result of that is a sense of ownership that became so strong. The very fact the way the public took to it instantly, that not just surprised me, it delighted me. Everybody had a comment, everybody had something to say. They were much freer, the public was much freer with its commentary about the works that were in the garden than those in the museum. They took ownership right away. I find that when I need inspiration for my work, I'll take my path that I've discovered for myself around the sculpture garden to, um, to look at the cherry, to look at the benches. I, that's one, another one of my favorites. Um, and in the summertime to explore the flowers that are um, out and um, so well maintained and beautiful during the summer, just for more inspiration and to, um, to get up and move and to be a part of my community. I come here to, to meet someone, to eat lunch, to read, to just sit. Um, I come here 
if I, even just to, if let's say I'm having a bad day, I just come here to kind of get rejuvenated. Um, I think there's something to be said about being surrounded by a bunch of um, sculptures that are all very different. It's an open area with um, free art that you can sit on, that you can uh, take a picture of, that you can be a part of, that you can um, love, you can reject, you can laugh at, you can admire, um, and it's just a wonderful space to get to um, explore. I love this. My husband hates it. <laughs> But, you know, we still have these awesome conversations about it when we talk about the glass fish. If you look at, at many of the signature works in the garden, they are about um, uh, exchange between the public uh, and the work of art. They may invite you to sit, like the Marc de Suvro piece where kids play and swing, you know, on uh, Eric Adea, um, which is one of the most popular pieces in the garden or Dan Graham's uh, wonderful pavilion uh, where people uh, can see their reflections and see sort of different layers and dimensions of the texture and materiality of the garden or Jenny Holzer's benches, which invite you to sit and contemplate and read and have, again, very personal connections. Um, and some of it's functional, like the Jackie Ferrara piece that was, was literally creating a stage for programming. Every year uh, we do a, a concert that has um, over 10,000 people rock the garden. It's really one of the most popular events that launches the summer here in the Twin Cities. You'll see people getting married right in the garden. Um, you'll see um, at certain times of year and usually around our anniversary celebrations, we do an artist design mini golf course that people can come and avail themselves. Sometimes you might even see live action role players that may descend into the garden or the Society of Plein Air Painters that comes every summer and focuses on the Barry Flanagan piece and the Oldenburg um, and become this incredible way for the public and the artwork to come together through another artist's vision. So many things happen all the time, and I think that's one of the other reasons why people love to come to the garden, because of the people and the experiences that they might have, some of it very serendipitous and some of it very planned. The development of the parade and the sculpture garden and their various lives demonstrates the, the capacity of people um, of a city to change, um, to adapt, to try to continue to provide something that's useful, uplifting um, to citizens. Uh, again, the beauty of the sculpture garden is that anybody can walk in. It's, it's public land. And I think that's um, part of the value of having it be parkland. No one can ever charge for that, I don't think. The part of me that loves art can just look at this as a place. The part of me that understands public policy continues to admire the fact that somehow this was a way to get the state, the highway department, the park board, the arts community, the city, all together to do something that is pretty out of the box for each of them individually. And really together says that um, we do things together that we could never do ourselves. It, it says that the citizens here value art. It, said, it says that the park board itself believes that art is part of a landscape that should be public landscape, and then both of us want to make art accessible. We've divided the world up into private and public space. Most of it is private. Most buildings people don't have access to. And the landscape is one of the few things that we can share in common. Any city that can invest in a public space like this and keep it up um, really values uh, an opportunity for people to um, congregate and actually fellowship with one another. and like. Uh, when I came here during the summer, I, I made friends just while I was here, which was just an awesome experience, and that's exactly why you need a park like this anyway, so you get to know your neighbors. I think also one of the things that's great about it is I find something new every time I go there. Even if there isn't something new installed, the light is different, the sound is different, sometimes even the smell is different, and um, so the experience can be so many different things. When I think back to what I originally thought of, I imagined that it would be an outdoor gallery. It's that, but it's really more a, um, a backdrop for all the different pieces of life in Minnesota. The Minneapolis Sculpture Garden is a Minnesota partnership co-production of the Walker Art Center on the web at walkerart.org. 
and Twin Cities Public Television. Funding has been provided in part by the Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund, administered by the Minnesota Historical Society.